The opening day of the season at a gloriously sunny Rico Arena and Sunderland's first ever visit to Coventry City's new ground. Niall Quinn's first game as a manager started well at least. Sunderland's opening goal of this season scored six minutes into the second half by Daryl Murphy. But the Sky Blues introduction of former Black Cat Don Hutchison would change the game and they'd be undone by some smart swift Coventry thinking twice in the space of nine minutes this one from Stern John who we'd see much more of later in the season and this winner from Gary McSheffrey 11 minutes from time meaning Niall's first game as manager and chairman would end in defeat Two seasons ago, Sunderland started at Coventry City and lost that match at Highfield Road, but would then go on to win the league. Perhaps then, this was a Norman. We should all bide our time. The first home game of the season. Clive Clark had signed from West Ham barely 24 hours earlier, but his Sunderland debut would be one he would probably want to forget. Barely minutes after coming on as a first-half sub for the injured Steve Caldwell, Clark clipped Damian Johnson just inside the box. Mikel Fussell expertly converting this penalty past Ben Anik. The 26,000 Sunderland fans would go home hoping that Saturday's visit of Plymouth would bring the first points of the season. It took just 40 seconds for Sunderland to take the lead against Plymouth, the second fastest Sunderland home goal on record. But like at Coventry City, Darrell Murphy's opener wouldn't settle the match. David Norris pulled things back inside the seven minute mark for the visitors. Barry Hales pounced on this Kenny Cunningham back pass seven minutes from half time to make it 2 1 to the Pilgrims. Sunderland worked tirelessly in the second half, but this Stephen Elliott goal six minutes after the hour mark still wouldn't be enough. Nine minutes before the full time whistle, Plymouth substitute Nick Chadwick robbed Danny Collins for slotting home in front of the ecstatic visiting support. It would be the first time in the club's history they would lose their first three league games in successive seasons. An uninspiring first half which ended badly. Into stoppage time and defender Adam Barrett's header sent Southend into the dressing room one up at the break. Arnau made his first appearance in a Sunderland shirt and, for a while, lifted the lads, coming on as a second-half sub. But Adam Barrett would find the net once more. And then Lee Bradbury would make sure, two minutes from time. On any other day, this John Stead goal, his second and last ever for Sunderland, might have raised a smile at least, but a smile was far from the minds of the nearly 2,000 Sunderland fans that had made that long trip south. 
They left thinking it couldn't get any worse, but at Gig Lane later that week, it would. This League Cup game at bottom of the league, Berry would prove to be the catalyst for a new dawn at Sunderland AFC, but for those who travelled down to Gig Lane, it would be a night to forget. Sunderland's new 3-5-2 formation would last just minutes. Just three, to be precise, before referee Michael Jones sees something that no one else does. And when he eventually finds the right card, he sends off R now on his first ever Sunderland start. It would be his only start of the season. The next 78 minutes would be a grind for the Black Cats and eventually Berry broke them down. Substitute Brian Barry Murphy created both goals. The first on 83 minutes for John Fitzgerald, who was promptly sent off with a second yellow card for the celebration. The second goal, two minutes from time from Andy Bishop. It felt as bad as it gets for Sunderland fans, but fortunately, it would be. Straight after the game, an emotional Niall Quinn would reveal he had an ace up his sleeve, a world-class name, a man who would take the club to new heights. At Gig Lane that night, it felt that surely the only way was up. And so it proved. The visit of West Brom to Sunderland Stadium of Light, the last game of a torrid month, which would herald the dawn of a new age. This would be Niall Quinn's last game as a manager, the man soon to be king would watch from on high in the stands and it was the lift that everyone needed. Just after the half an hour mark, Dean Whitehead scored direct from this corner and the lads were on their way. Neil Collins helped secure the season's first points, heading home from debutant Tobias Hussein's free kick just a minute after the break. It was Sunderland's first win of the season. It was now Quinn's last in charge as manager. Quinney could now spend all his time as chairman and doing the work needed to make sure the Sunderland Magic carpet ride would be as smooth as possible for the new man in charge of the team. Fitting, perhaps, that Roy Keane's first game as Sunderland's manager should come at Pride Park. Deadline day would be a blur of signings, six of them in fact. Four of those, Graham Kavanagh, David Connolly, Ross Wallace and Liam Miller would make their debuts here. Another, Stan Varga, would become the 14th player in Sunderland's history to make his second debut for the club. The sixth, Dwight York, would have to wait for his debut and watch from the stand, having just travelled halfway around the world signing from Australian club Sydney. But Derby hadn't read the script, or at least Matt Oakley hadn't, scoring this goal in first half stoppage time. But this would be Sunderland's day, and a dramatic 90 second period just after the hour mark made all the difference. Chris Brown bundled the ball home for the equaliser, before new boy Ross Wallace scored the winner. It would be the first, but not the last time we'd see Wallace wave his shirt around his head. The revolution was underway. This was Sunderland's biggest away win since the romp at Gillingham more than two years ago, and a world away from the nightmare at Gig Lane. Liam Miller, booed with virtually every touch from the fans he'd played for the previous season, would silence them with the opener just before the hour mark. Graham Kavanagh added a second on the stroke of half time, the ninth on the trot scored by a different player. And two became three just minutes into the second half. Stephen Elliott capping off an amazing evening. After so long being a bogey ground, the lads had completed their third successive win at Ellen Road.
Roy Keane called this a reality check. Matt Fryatt gave the visitors the lead just after the break. And while Sunderland couldn't quite find the zest they'd shown in their previous few games, they certainly showed resilience. In Sweden, they pronounce it Tobias Hussein, although his first goal in English football looked good in any language. Just moments after coming off the bench, Toby would score the goal that made sure the points were shared. This would be Roy Keane's first taste of defeat as a manager and the first of three successive games they'd lose on the road. Sunderland didn't even have a shot on target in the game. A goal, the game's opener, was scored by Ipswich. Jason DeVos turning into his own net just before the half-hour mark. And within two minutes, things were all square again. Darren Curry, too hot for Ben Annick. In the second half, things would go from bad to worse. Irish international Alan Lee scoring not once, but twice, pouncing on this Stan Varga error to wrap up the game. While a second yellow card for Ross Wallace made him see red, the honeymoon period was definitely over. Back at the Stadium of Light and a glorious Saturday afternoon, another Cork sporting hero, Sonia O'Sullivan, was in town to cheer on Sunderland for the following day's Great North run. But for Grant Ledbetter, it was the day he'd score the goal he'd dream of all his life. For the Sunderland fan growing up in fence houses, his first ever goal for the club, this winner against Sheffield Wednesday, would be a moment he would never forget. The lads had a fortnight off before their next game with an international break. They headed off to Portugal for some warm weather training. But they'd come back to these shores with a bump. It was the first time Sunderland had conceded four goals at this level for almost a decade and would be the start of some unhappy encounters with the Lily Whites. The signs were ominous when former Black Cat Danny Dicho scored his first ever Preston League goal after firing 41 previous blanks. Graham Alexander doubled North End's advantage with this penalty on 31 minutes. And things went from bad to worse four minutes later, Dean Whitehead putting through his own goal. Simon Whaley made it four, ten minutes into the second half, although he would score a goal that we'd thank him for in the last match of the season. Stan Varga's first goal since returning to Sunderland would add little more than scant consolation. Roy Keane had said before this game he'd taken his wife out for a meal and could only think about his defenders. They'd give him more food for thought here. Keane made five changes for this trip to the Britannia, although it was marred within minutes of getting underway. Roy Delap's Stoke home debut on loan from Sunderland would end with an accidental yet sickening leg break. Dwight York gave the lads a first half lead, poking past Sunderland supporter Steve Simonson in the Stoke goal. but within just 10 minutes of the second half, they were chasing the game. First on loan Lee Hendry, and then Vincent Pericard would score the goals that would send Sunderland home empty-handed. It was the fourth time this season they would lose after leading. It wouldn't happen again. Perseverance was the name of the game against Barnsley, thanks to two goals in the last eight minutes. Nosworthy and Lawrence would help create the first with this move down the right for Dean Whitehead's opener. Ross Wallace came off the bench and Barnsley's defenders were bamboozled, creating havoc and this chance headed home in textbook fashion by Chris Brown. This win meant that Sunderland had already beaten last season's meagre points total after just 14 games.
It looked like Sunderland might have to settle for a point at the KC, even though both teams missed some great chances. But we've come to learn we should never give up on Sunderland. Two minutes into stoppage time, Ross Wallace grabbed the winner and all three points. Unfortunately, thanks to a repeat of his half-naked celebrations, he also grabbed a second yellow card and ultimately a red. He would have to sit out the next two matches. Halloween at the Stadium of Light and top of the table Cardiff came to play tricks without treats. If Sunderland fans weren't sick of the sight of Michael Chopra after his last visit to the Stadium of Light, it would take just four minutes to become even worse. Chris Brown would level things before we'd even reach the ten-minute mark. But Chopra inflicted even more pain on Sunderland seven minutes before half-time. Poor was Roy Keane's post-match reaction. The lads hadn't given a good account of themselves for their biggest test so far. This was almost as one-sided as it could get, yet for all their hard work, Sunderland just couldn't capitalise. For Norwich City, it was one chance, one goal. Robert Earnshaw just after half-time. Sunderland had good shouts for penalties, but would go home with nothing. The 11th of the 11th, Remembrance Day. Both Sunderland and visitors Southampton are welcomed onto the pitch by members of the 2-2-2 signal squadron. The shirts all had poppies printed on them and would later raise thousands for charity on the club's official website, safc.com. It was a far from classic encounter, but eventually Ross Wallace would break the deadlock just after the hour mark, becoming the first player signed by Roy Keane to score at the Stadium of Light. And for once, he kept his shirt on. Darren Ward would give himself a story to tell for the rest of his life with this save from Pele. But Lady Luck would play a part in the end. Gareth Bale's last minute shot deflected off Steve Caldwell and passed a helpless Darren Ward. The draw would see Sunderland drop to 19th and the lowest they would ever be under Roy Keane. Next up at the Stadium of Lights, Colchester United, and this would be a game of firsts. It was the first ever game between the two teams. Stephen Elliott made his first start since August, recovering from an ankle injury, to score his first goal since the first month of the season. Two of them, in fact, either side of the break. Chris Iwalumo made it a nervy last 10 minutes at the Stadium of Light with this goal. Until David Connolly's first ever goal for Sunderland since his August move from Wigan. It was Sunderland's first win in four championship matches. All the talk leading up to this match was the head-to-head -head managerial duel of Roy Keane and Mick McCarthy. The cameras got their handshake off the pitch, while on the pitch we'd see plenty of chances and plenty of fine saves from Darren Ward. After the game, he said he thought he could have done better with Jamal Johnson's strike just before the break. Maybe, if he had longer arms. But Stephen Elliott helped bring back a point ten minutes from time. It was Sunderland's first away draw of the season. They were queuing up for the television show, never mind the buzzcocks just down the road. But at Loftus Road, Sunderland were queuing up for a hatful of chances, most of which went begging. Until Daryl Murphy used his head to find the back of the net on 17 minutes. 
four minutes into stoppage time, added on at the end of the first half because of something thrown at the linesman from the stands, Grant Ledbitter doubled Sunderland's advantage, rolling around Royce for this calm as you like strike. Ray Jones came off the bench to score against the run of play for the Hoops, but the points were never in doubt, as all three were heading back to the North East. Revenge could be quick against Norwich City, but Roy Keane went into this game asking for consistency, and he got it. From Darren Ward to the back of the net without Norwich touching the ball, Darrell Murphy once again opened the scoring. This time, the only goal of the game in a hard-fought contest. Graft, rather than Grace, would see them through. Roy Keane admitted before this game he had something of a soft spot for Luton. That wouldn't last long. Five minutes into the encounter, they were a goal up. Dean Morgan scoring past debutant Martin Fulop in for a poorly Darren Ward. It would take just four minutes to be back on level terms though. Darrell Murphy scoring against his former club and for the third successive match. Luton would head home ruining missed opportunities. David Connolly would head home full of confidence after this quality strike kept all three points on Wearside. This was more than a phoenix from the flames. This was a sign of intent that Sunderland would fight and fight all the way to the wire this season to get back into the Premiership. Kyle Lafferty scored two goals that would normally have won the game for the Clarets. But ten minutes from time, the tide turned. Grant Ledbetter first, and then David Connolly to steal a point, an almost carbon copy on the stroke of full time. So good in fact that one Sunderland fan here falls out the stand. The lads were now unbeaten in seven and halfway up the league. One more before Christmas, the Friday night trip to Selhurst Park. And there were some concerns over whether this game might get called off with heavy fog rolling over the stands. The thousand or so Sunderland fans who'd made the long and difficult journey probably wished it had been. Roy Keane said he didn't think they deserved anything after this performance. Mark Hudson scored the only goal of the game to make sure they didn't. The manager said if his players didn't show more desire and passion to win, they'd soon be out the door. It wasn't a very happy Christmas. But Boxing Day was better, and the fight the manager had called for from his players was back in abundance. They'd have to wait until past the hour mark before the breakthrough would come, though. David Connolly's third goal in four games. Grant Ledbetter lashed home the second, decisive goal, ten minutes from time. Leeds number two, Gus Poyet, sending off for unsporting behaviour only added to the Sunderland supporters' seasonal celebrations. Preston would offer a much sterner test four days later. The last game of 2006, a year of enormous transition in the life of Sunderland AFC, but a year that would end on a flat note. Yet again, Preston would prove a thorn in Sunderland's side. A defensive reshuffle just quarter of an hour in after Steve Caldwell got injured didn't help. David Nugent's goal nine minutes before half-time helped even less.
2007 started with a bang at the Walker Stadium, the first time they'd won an away game on New Year's Day since 1915 and only the second time ever. Sunderland dominated the match with 23 efforts on goal, but had to wait until 11 minutes from time before one found the back of the net. Tobias Hussein opening the scoring. Former Fox David Connolly continued his rich vein of form, scoring the second and securing the points. With Sunderland now into 10th place in the Championship, it was time to think about the Cup. For the second time running, Preston would provide Sunderland's first defeat of the new year. But also beat them 1-0 for the second time in the space of just seven days. It wasn't as one-sided as the league encounter at Deepdale though. That Ormrod strike on the half-hour mark was the only goal of the game. But to add to Sunderland's woes, Liam Miller was sent off just before the break for two bookable offences. Sunderland were out of the FA Cup, but with new faces arriving at the club, it would be the last time they'd taste defeat for some time. It was a windy one at Sunderland Stadium of Light. For Johnny Evans and Carlos Edwards, it would be their first view of the stadium as Sunderland players. Anthony Stokes also made his debut, and they'd all end winners. David Connolly's fifth goal in seven matches would be the start of an amazing unbeaten run. They'd finished the day ninth. The season would finish much higher. Those who were at Hillsborough were treated to a world record attempt for air guitar, which failed miserably, and the start of a new chant for Roy Keane. Hey Jude would become Hey Keno. And they were also treated to six goals. On 20 minutes, Dwight York. The stroke of half time, Tobias Hussein. And just before the hour mark, David Connolly and Sunderland were cruising. But when Dion Burton scored this one with nine minutes to go, followed by Wade's small strike with three minutes on the clock, Roy Keane could quite easily have spontaneously combusted. Carlos Edwards seized unnecessary nerves with Sunderland's fourth in the 88th minute. When I asked Roy Keane after the match if any of his players had injuries, he merely responded, not yet. It was another sign that Sunderland's bar had been raised higher than ever before. Sunderland's 100% league record in 2007 would end here against Crystal Palace, although Darren Ward could feel happy knowing he'd been beaten just once in his last five home appearances. Her Royal Highness the Countess of Wessex was watching this one. I'm sure the conversation back at the Palace wouldn't be about this game against this palace. It took just 19 minutes for Dwight York to open this game wide open and it was one straight off the training ground. Ross Wallace with the free kick before eventually Dwight York heads home at point blank range. The points were confirmed six minutes from time with this cracker from Carlos Edwards, although his best goals were still to come. This was a hard slog for Sunderland for the first hour, although the arrival of Anthony Stokes from the bench on 66 minutes helped change the tide. Two minutes later, he'd score his first Sunderland goal and his first in English football. Within another three minutes, the game would be effectively ended. David Connolly's seventh goal in ten games, securing all three points. The Black Cats were only out of the playoffs because of goal difference.
which after this game got a whole lot better. After just four minutes, David Connolly's rich vein continues. That's eight in 11 now. 13 minutes was lucky for Tobias Hussein. That's when he added this second. The second half was equally as enjoyable. Stern John scored his first goal for Sunderland since signing from Coventry City. Then, two minutes later, the second one came along. And leave you to laugh about buses. The win lifted Sunderland into the playoff places for the first time this season. Next up, a tough midweek trip to St Andrews. A Shrove Tuesday night feast that would end almost as flat as the proverbial pancake. The two and a half thousand travelling Sunderland supporters were lifted high with this cracker from Carlos Edwards just before the half hour mark. But virtually on the stroke of full time, substitute DJ Campbell popped up to be a thorn in Sunderland's side again. Last season he scored the goals for Brentford that knocked them out the FA Cup. Here with virtually the last kick of the game, he robbed Sunderland of two points. But it was the first goal they'd conceded in 453 minutes of football and it still provided a vital point and it stopped Birmingham from hitting the top of the table. This was Roy Keane's 30th match as manager. Six months ago, he took charge. But go back further. Go back 63 matches. Go back to November 2005 and the last time you saw this. A Sunderland penalty awarded. David Connolly, the scorer of Sunderland's first spot kick since Dean Whitehead's conversion last season against Aston Villa. Giles Barnes showed his class on the hour mark and for a while it looked like someone might have to settle for just a point. But perhaps thanks to the club's decision to stick with a three o'clock Saturday kickoff instead of moving it for the telly, they were willed on for this winner. Two minutes into stoppage time, five foot seven inch Liam Miller heading the winner. A well-deserved win at the Hawthorns as Sunderland became the first team to beat the Baggies on home soil since November the 11th. Dwight York was precision perfect, finding the bottom corner for the first after 24 minutes. Five minutes into the second half, Stern John doubled the lead. Darren Carter played the obligatory former player scores against his old team card to add a little tension to the last 18 minutes. But by the time Paul Robinson was sent off for a professional foul by Dermot Gallagher, Sunderland had done the hard work to secure the three points. After the match, Baggies boss Tony Mowbray rather emotionally stated his team would finish the season higher than Sunderland. I hope he didn't have any money on that. Despite dominating for massive periods of the match, it would take 65 minutes before they'd make a breakthrough. Grant Ledbetter sending the thousands of Sunderland fans into raptures. David Connolly, second in stoppage time at the end of the game, would send all the fans home happy. The previous two times Sunderland have played at Barnsley in the league, they've won the championship. Perhaps yet another omen. Sunderland would never hold the lead in this Tuesday night thriller, but they'd never give up hope. A rare Darren Ward error allowed Darrell Russell to open the scoring. Within a minute, Dean Whitehead levelled it all up. Just as everyone was probably thinking about a half-time pie, Carl Hufkins restored the visitors' lead. The next 45 minutes were tense and pulsating. The fighters kept on fighting and on the stroke of full time, Darrell Murphy came up with the goods. The club record of 12 games unbeaten since the turn of the year was equalled. On St Patrick's Day, they beat it. 
Johnny Evans got a smack to the head and concussion in that last match against Stoke. Within two minutes against Hull, he put his head to better effect. <laughs> Tigers keeper Boaz Myhill did well for the next 88 minutes, but then undid it all with this sliced kick for Stern John to wrap it up in the last minute and put Sunderland into the automatic places for the first time in the season. There'd be a good sing-song in the Stadium of Light to celebrate St Patrick's Day that night. Seven days later, arguably the song of the season would be born in South Wales. The weather inside Ninian Park was dreadful and didn't help create a flowing game. Ross Wallace would come off the bench to score the only goal just after the hour mark. But perhaps the headlines were made off the pitch on this one. Nyron Nosworthy would suddenly have a song worthy of his amazing season. The travelling thousands rewriting the Amy Winehouse classic Rehab just for Nugsy. While the magic carpet ride was making a detour via Bristol Airport in one or two taxis. Back at the Stadium of Light for Bank Holiday weekend and despite keeping up their winning run, games in hand for others pushed Sunderland back out of the automatic places. Before the game, Roy Keane thought consistency would see them through to the wire and ultimately he'd be right. Darrell Murphy's first came just after quarter of an hour. Just after the hour mark, Ross Wallace made it two and didn't even seem tempted to take his top off this time. Andy Keogh halved the deficit just moments later. But the biggest championship gate of the season so far would head home happy. Next stop, Easter Monday at St Mary's. The quarter past five kickoff meant Sunderland started this match knowing that thanks to slip ups elsewhere that afternoon, a win would put them top. Marek Saganowski didn't care. 11 minutes into the second half, the Saints perhaps thought they'd done enough with this goal. If they did, they hadn't watched Sunderland this season. When Carlos Edwards approached the area, everyone who had pretty much knew what would happen next. With three minutes left on the clock, Sunderland came from behind to win again for the third time this season. Grant Ledbitter thundering the ball home. And Sunderland were now top for the first time and there was no looking back. Grand National Day at Sunderland Stadium of Light. Roy Keane was making sure his players wouldn't fall in the final furlong. And it was Sunderland who would come out the stalls flying. Just seven minutes into the match, Dean Whitehead putting them into the lead. You'll have to rewind six months for the last penalty against Sunderland. You'll recognise the referee if you do. Dexter Blackstock brought down, Martin Rowlands converting. The winner would bring back memories, but you'd only have to go back five days for this one. Grant Ledbitter off the bench and firing home. It was Sunderland's fifth successive win and 17th game unbeaten. Promotion was now within their sight, but would become temporarily blurred seven days later at Leia Road. It was easier to get Gary Rowell to buy a round than it was to get a ticket for the away end at Colchester United. It was invitation only and great to be there, even if the match was horrible for Sunderland fans. The fourth official scoreboard showed three minutes of stoppage time at the end of the first half. Inside the fifth minute of time added on, Wayne Brown brought the deadlock. Sunderland started the second half with their best spell of the game and after ten minutes of pressure, Colchester cracked. Dwight York heading home Darrell Murphy's cross. But as the lads went in search of the win, the home team caught them with a sucker punch on the counter-attack. Australian Richard Garcia put them back in the lead inside the last eight minutes and when Jamie Cureton went down in the area under a Dean Whitehead challenge with just a minute left on the clock 
goalkeeper picked himself up to end the game and Sunderland's unbeaten run. It wouldn't kill their hopes of promotion though, they would be reinvigorated the following Friday against Burnley. This was the weekend Sunderland would secure promotion. It officially came on the Sunday when Crystal Palace did us a favour by beating Derby County. But on this Friday night, we weren't to know and the Stadium of Light would be treated to one of its finest ever matches. The match commentary comes courtesy of Magic 1152, Lord Gary of Rao and myself, Simon Crabtree. Every Burnley player bar Paul McVeigh inside the penalty area as referee Kettle just spots something on the uh, edge of six yards. Where is he coming over now? He's going to have a word at Brian Jensen. I didn't see particularly anything, but I wasn't looking is the honest answer. Dave Connolly is standing on his toes. Jensen is the best part of three or four inches taller than him anyway. Maybe now we can have this corner. Carlos Edwards swings it towards the edge of six yards and it's a glancing header away that finds Danny Collins just outside the box on this near right-hand side. Johnny Evans plays a 1-2 with him. Now it comes to Liam Miller. A bit further back as he sends a diagonal ball towards roughly the penalty spot. Murphy might get a chance. Right-footed Connolly. Well, he's offside. He's offside. It missed anyway. Everybody seemed to jump up as one there. The linesman's flag on this near left-hand side uh, was up like a shot. Jason yeah. Tyus on this near side. He missed the target, wouldn't have mattered, but a half chance, perhaps. Yeah, it was. Um, as you say, the flag did go up, but um, everybody in front of us thought that went in, you know. <laughs> Here comes Sunderland now, it will be Anthony Stokes as he pushes it in front of him, give it Carlos Edwards, now he does, first the control, second oh. hits Jensen's legs. And you just wonder whether Anthony Stokes held on for it, for that little modicum too long before eventually releasing it to Carlos Edwards. One touch to control and Jensen, the giant that he is between the sticks, made himself even bigger and blocked it with his legs. Golden chance for Simon. Got to say, should have scored there. Credit to the keeper because uh, he did well, but chance gone. Carlos Edwards throws in. It's a, a looping header from Daryl Murphy. Looks disappointed in himself with it, in fact. And Jensen picks it back up again. Just noticed actually that Carlos Edwards, who's had his hair very tightly braided for the past couple of weeks, is uh, loose and looking uh, a bit more fluffy. I know that's not the word to it's use. Afro -y that's perhaps. the word I was looking for. <laughs> Couldn't find it. I'll get you you know your hair cuts, <laughs> don't you? I do and uh, very fluffy afro tonight anyway. Looks like something like the hair bear bunch. In fact, as forward comes Sunderland, left-hand side, nice couple of one-twos. Stokes gets to the edge of the area, was off balance all the way to 18 yards. Now Dave Connolly will grab the loose ball. Left-hand side, by the corner flag. He's got Duff between him and a cross. He's got two players now as he still works into the near post and it's Darren Murphy, no flag, goal Sunderland, Burnley stops and looks at Jason Tyus, the laser on this near left hand side, he got worked in, it will be Darren Murphy who's got the goal, his eighth of the season and with just a 13 and a half minutes on the clock, Sunderland get the breakthrough. Yeah, there was a little suspicion of offside there, wasn't there? I think Darren Murphy looked round just to make sure about... I did as well, I, I looked straight at the... Uh, the I'm linesman. looking at the replay now, Gary, and he's definitely onside. Yeah. Definitely onside. I looked straight away at the linesman, no flag, 1-0. That's the start we wanted. We've so already had a chance that we've missed. Number 11, Daryl And it will be a red and white throw-in. In fact, he's going to come back a lot further than that. I thought he'd have gone out deeper towards the halfway line but where Danny Simpson's taken this is not a million miles away from the edge of the area he gets the return ball from Daryl Murphy sends in a cross Connolly goes to meet it again stumbled penalty oh. wow he went in to get it Wayne Thomas came up to meet him as well and the referee Trevor Kettle had no hesitation whatsoever than to point to the spot Wayne Thomas penalised for a foul on Dave Connolly and Sunderland get their second penalty of the season. Well, I've seen Stonewall is not given for Sunderland and uh, I think the Burnley will think it's a bit harsh, but we'll take that one. You having a look on the replay. Yeah, I'm still not convinced. I'm not convinced, but well. uh, it's a penalty. 19 and a half minutes gone, 1-0 up and a penalty. Couldn't wish for a much better start than this. Well, we went 
so long as the referee going to bring out a yellow card here. He's certainly got his notepad out. I think it might even be Steve Caldwell who ends up in the referee's notepad. It was the Derby County game. We'll try and confirm if anybody did get booked in that for you. Producer Chris, I'm sure, has got his eyes on the monitors. But the most important statistic you need to know now is that David Connolly, in the last home game of the season, has got a penalty on 20 minutes to double Sunderland's advantage. From 12 yards, Jensen in front of him. Jensen doesn't do too badly and penalties, just ask Wolves last season he saved two against Wolves and then a, a glutton in the penalty shootout in their League Cup game Connolly against Jensen right footed, saved it again I told you he had a great record in penalty shootouts, Brian Jensen in penalties of any kind he got down to his right hand side Connolly's wasn't the firmest as penalties and he pushed it behind for a corner Here is Daryl Murphy, nods it into space, the edge of the area, gets past Harley, tries the outside of his left boot, might find Carlos Edwards, has to drop pass back to the edge of the area with Liam Miller who pushes it wider than Mark. Well, it was all ifs and buts as Sunderland tried to create the chance, Burnley flinging bodies left, right and centre at the ball, eventually the clearest opportunity came to Liam Miller, still had a lot to do and couldn't quite find the target. Yeah, he tried to pass it in there, didn't he, but it just went outside, but thought Murphy did well there. I think he, he read that situation very well, got in behind the, the Burnley back four, got a shot in which Jensen could only parry in from there, Sunderland had another, another chance, but uh, just went wide, we can't get that second goal, can we? Still 1-0, Sunderland. Jamba Jamba has the ball now in the centre circle for Burnley, pushed past through, Wade Elliott inside the area, goes to the floor and the referee has given a penalty. Well, Darren Ward went to the feet of Wade Elliott. Elliott stumbled to the floor. Darren Ward is urging the referee to go and have a conflagration with Keith Lawson, the linesman on the far side of the field. All eyes are at Lawson, but for some reason, the referee doesn't want him involved. He's pointed to the penalty spot, and as the referee is concerned, as we just see a replay now, Elliott goes through, Ward gets a touch, and I'm not convinced he got any of the player, Gary. Well, it's given us at the far end from us, but the bottom line is the penalty's been given. Darren Ward still actually arguing, is he? Well, he's trying to involve the linesman yeah. in here, the referee. And if, if, he, if they want us to call them assistant referees, then surely he should ask him to assist. He hasn't gone across to him. He's now trying to clear the penalty area. Now, at the other end, 18 minutes ago, Burnley had a penalty to defend Dave Connolly missed it now Sunderland have a penalty de to defend it will be Andy Gray who can possibly get his 14th of the season against Darren Ward still looking to keep the clean sheet former teammates perhaps Andy Gray against Darren Ward will step up right footed sends Ward the wrong way Talks it into the corner. Wade has uh, now Andy Gray goes over to antagonise the North Stand, celebrates in front of them. The, sun, the Stadium of Light falls silent a little. Confirmation of the goal scorer 1 1. Yeah, it's been the tail of two penalties, really, hasn't it, in this half in many ways. We've got an early goal, then we got a penalty. Could have been 2 0, but it wasn't to be. And lo and behold, Burnley get one of their own, and it's 1 1. So few twists in the told you Simon it's going to be a long night this one 39 minutes on the clock and it's 1-1 one, one now well Burnley back in the game then towards the edge of the box almost now Anthony Stokes is going to fancy his chances charged down by Stephen Caldwell just on the edge of the penalty area back in the centre circle Sunderland start to turn the thumb screw a little the crowd try and lift them towards goal Edwards sends in the cross, Conley, a uh, handball, apparently, says the linesman on the far side of that field, given in favour of Burnley. It was just a, a stooping control, really, from Dave Conley, and uh, Keith Lawson, the Lincolnshire official on that far side, 
had his flag up straight away. Yeah, the North Stand didn't agree with it. As soon as the flag went up there, they weren't happy with that decision. But it was given, free kick to Burnley. Just looking at the Burnley fans, actually, they've bought 200, 250, three tops. They've uh, not brought very many tonight. Sunderland have filled virtually all the other parts as Burnley trail. Oh, oh! What a goal from Burnley! It was about 25 yards out. They just pulled the trigger and fired it into the top right-hand corner. Darren Ward had absolutely no chance whatsoever as Wade Elliott continues his rich vein of form in front of goal. His fourth of the season and Burnley take the lead. Well, it was some strike, wasn't it, from way outside the box and uh, just flew into the top corner. But now we knew that... <laughs> said earlier on it was going to be a long night it really is now 2-1 down the one good thing if there is any good thing to take out is there is a fair way to go on this second half that has put Burnley in the lead from a goal behind and the comeback Kings on the telly can Sunderland equal things up here's Carlos Edwards that must be a penalty it is again the referee points to the spot Carlos Edwards went past Brian Jensen the Big Dane stretched out a hand and dropped him. And we will now see the third penalty this evening at the Stadium of Light. Carlos Edwards tried to go past his man, went to the floor. And the referee, Trevor Kettle, had no hesitation. Once again, a point into the spot. So the third spot kick this evening. The first one was missed by David Connolly. The second one was converted by Andy Gray. Third time looking for Sunderland. It's Connolly again. He could make amends. He could score his first goal in eight games. It's one-on-one, -on -one, mano et mano. Connolly against Jensen. This time, Convert slams it down the middle. The relief is palpable around the Stadium of Light. From the ashes, and we almost mean that literally after the week we've had here in the Stadium of Light. We are all square again. Now this time, don't chuck it away. I'm not sure he knew exactly what to do with that then. Sunderland do, and it's to clear it to Grant Ledbitter. Infield slightly. Murphy, he's only got one man in support. He's got four men back in defence. He finds Carlos Edwards, the second in support. Long range effort. Oh. oh, 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 my goodness me. That was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Carlos Edwards, about 80 yards out, maybe 100. He was on the banks of the weir. He pulled the trigger. He nearly burst the net. I burst a blood vessel or 10. What a way to get back in the lead. Carlos Edwards, fifth of the season, and the best you will ever, ever see. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Did I say that was brilliant? Did you think it was a good one? Then? Oh, oh. Number seven, Carlos Edwards. I think I've wet my knickers. It was like an Exocet missile, lad. <laughs> it just flew in. If they were. My God, if there was no net there, it would be still travelling into the North Sea, I'm sure. It, <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic shot. Terrific goal. We've seen him do it a few times oh. now. But that was just absolute perfection. The last game of the season and another red-hot ticket, although Sunderland fans would find seats on all sides of Kenilworth Road. With promotion already secure, Sunderland knew even if they win here, they'd need to rely on Preston North End doing them a favour for the first time this season. To say they made sure of their own win first was perhaps an understatement. It took Anthony Stokes just four minutes to give them the lead,
Two minutes later, Daryl Murphy helped crumble the already relegated Luton with this second. The third would come in the first minute of the second half, again from Daryl Murphy. And about the time Ross Wallace was adding this fourth, Simon Whaley was scoring for North End against Birmingham and the championship was on its way to the North East. A fifth from David Connolly was the cherry on top of the icing on top of the championship cake. The referee's full-time whistle confirmed Sunderland's promotion back to the top flight on their first attempt for the first time ever. Now the celebrations could begin. Sunderland AFC back in the Premiership as champions. Off the pitch, now Quinn and Drummerville are now preparing to give Roy Keane and his men on the pitch everything they need to keep Sunderland a team on the up.